first I'm going to go ahead and start the recording. And people are still rolling in. Mm -hmm. We'll go ahead and get started here. So today's webinar is OER challenges as well as opportunities. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Membership here at WCET. As we go through our program today, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A box, preferably not the chat because we tend to lose the questions that are added to the chat box, but add those to the Q&A box and we'll keep an eye on those and we'll interject where needed. Otherwise, we'll hold those to the Q&A portion. This is being recorded and we'll share a link out with you to the archive, the PowerPoint, and any additional resources that are shared. You should be able to download today's PowerPoint presentation from the chat. And if you'd like to follow along on Twitter, the hashtag is WCET Webcast. And you can also post questions there. We have live captioning available via Vitac, so we appreciate their support. Again, any questions, add them to the Q&A box and we'll make sure to get those. We have a wonderful moderator today, my dear friend and colleague, Tanya Spillavoy, who is the Director of Open Policy here at WCET. Welcome, Tanya. Hi, Megan, and welcome to everyone who is at the uh, webcast today. We are so excited to have you here. Uh, I saw the registration list, and there's a lot of names that I recognize and a lot of people that I'd love to get to know. So today we'd like to hold this as a conversation among three folks that I have so much respect for. Um, first, I wanna set the stage and talk about a little bit why we're bringing this um, topic forward. So we know that there has been a lot of disparity in higher education in the past, but the pandemic has really exasperated those inequities that we see. Um, I live right next door to a grade school and every day there's a little family of kids that brings their, um, their laptops and sits outside to access the free internet. And, you know, those kids were probably, um, had difficulty accessing education before, but now it's just so much more apparent because we're in the middle of a pandemic and um, students who previously might have been in a classroom are now having to access education in various ways, including sitting on, on the doorstep. So what can we do now um, to create a more equitable landscape as we transition? We've all had to transition to online courses. Um, we recognize that there's still a lot to be done in terms of equity and affordability. And this conversation today is really to talk about how open educational resources can aid in making um, education more accessible, provide affordability, and really bring to the forefront quality concerns. So um, we're gonna launch into that and talk about how we can make um, education more affordable and accessible and equitable for everyone. Um, and the, the folks today who are leading this discussion will be Will Cross, who's the Director of Copyright and Digital Scholarship at North Carolina State University, Elaine Thornton, who is an expert in online and distance education, and she's a librarian at the University of Arkansas, and Jenwin Wetzler, who is the Assistant Director of Open Education at Creative Commons. And I'll have um, Jenwin start by introducing herself, and she'll be our first guest today. All right, hopefully everyone can hear me. So first, thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm really delighted to be with you all and I can't wait to, to hear from our, our fellow panelists and speakers. Um, so I wanted to start off this, this uh, webcast with a couple thoughts on our opportunities and challenges with OER and then just kind of dial it back to a quick 101, really look at what we mean by open licenses and, and OER in hopes that this kind of tees up some of the, the other presentations and also helps us bring new people into the fold as we see more educators um, aware of OER in this, this current kind of climate. So to start, I, I wanna echo what Tanya was saying. I think we are all facing a, a really tremendous challenge right now with our global education crisis and not just in transitioning to distance education models, but in so many different sectors, interrelated sectors um, across the board. So 
I think we are seeing the, the inequity on fuller display than ever before. And at the same time, I want to note that I see a really beautiful thing in um, kind of emerging in this pandemic. And that's this immediate kind of peer-to-peer -peer sharing and learning that has been possible um, as a form of community resilience. So I think open education communities and open access communities as well are uniquely positioned to work with this kind of immediate response needed to build on existing educational resources and update them as soon as they see a need. As soon as they see a need to um, better meet audiences' needs, they can return to that resource and tweak it so that it is more universally applicable. I think this pandemic is a, a tremendous challenge, but we will always face periods of flux and uh, disruptions to our educational systems. I think that's inevitable. I think OER is not by any means a silver bullet, but hopefully these tools um, paired with other behaviors will offer educators and learners some more resilient options for um, education in times of flux and in times of stability. Um, we also I kind of alluded to this, but I think we're also seeing that this period is kind of opening a newfound space or receptivity for OER. I think, uh, at least in my family, and I, I think in a, a number of other um, education spaces, I've seen people who initially equate um, open education with online learning, and they are now recognizing that it is so much more than that. Um, so on the next slide, um, we can kind of look a little bit more at that. Um, I wanted to think about how we can best bring these kind of new educators into the fold, like with, with OER, like what we, what we can do to welcome in this broader community so we can develop, co-develop these tools to meet an even broader audience's um, set of needs than we have in the past. So I think we need very clear communication on open licensing and, and OER. So I wanted to really quickly just review a couple definitions and then give you two tips from Creative Commons that may help with your own communications with, um, with other educators or may kind of help sort of tee up some of the, the additional conversations that we're gonna have about opportunities. Um, so open education itself encompasses far more than just online learning. It's encompassing digital um, resources, tools, and practices that are free from legal and financial and technical barriers, um, and that can be fully used, shared, and adapted in the digital environment. So that's a definition that Spark uses that I really like. I see OER as tools used in and for open education. Um, I have a simpler definition of OER on the, the slide, but I wanted to really quickly just review the Creative Commons definition because I think it'll help make sense of some of the licensing elements um, in a minute. So Creative Commons defines OER as teaching, learning, and research materials that are either in the public domain, which means they exist outside of the, the realm of copyright and copyright law restrictions, or licensed in a way that provides everyone with free and perpetual permission to engage in 5R activities. So these activities are allowing users to retain the resource, to reuse the resource in, in different ways, whether you remix it or revise it. Um, you are allowed to remix the resource, to redistribute it with others. And these, these five R, R activities are key to open educational resources. Um, on the next slide, I'll give a quick overview of our open licenses. One thing that I should note is if you are curious about more information on, um, on OER, on open licensing in general, we have a 10 week online course about this that I am delighted to manage. So I'm always happy to talk more about it if you're interested. You can go to certificates.creativecommons.org and get all of this content and more obviously open licensed and available for, um, for your reuse as you like. So just really quickly, um, the, it's probably worth noting that Creative Commons licenses are um, one 
open license. They are, sorry, they are one form of open licenses. There are other open licenses out there, but Creative Commons licenses are considered the global standard and are kind of interoperable. And um, they span almost 2 billion works online. So today I'm gonna to just talk about Creative Commons licenses, but I acknowledge there are others. Okay, so Creative Commons licenses are kind of a way to work within the realm of copyright, but they allow for greater flexibilities for creators to share their work online, given how easy it is to share our works online already. So they work within the realm of copyright, but they're a little bit more flexible. They're still legal. Uh, these licenses, um, so where, where traditional copyright keeps um, permissions bundled together for creators as a way to kind of incentivize creators, Creative Commons licenses unbundle those permissions and allow creators to choose which permissions or on the flip side, which restrictions they pass on to users of their works. So this allows the creators to determine a little bit more flexibly how their works can be used and engaged with online and offline. All right, so I have two tips today. The main, well, I'll get to these two tips in a second. The, the thing I wanna really quickly touch on about our licenses are we have six different licenses ranging from least restrictive to most restrictive. Beyond those licenses are two public domain tools. So again, the public domain is the realm of copyright or the realm of our um, human knowledge and creativity that exists beyond copyright and any restrictions associated with copyright. So we have those um, two public domain tools, six licenses, and then the most restrictive um, option, which is not a CC license, is our traditional all rights reserved copyright. Four of our licenses are compatible with OER. So you see beyond the top two icons here, which are related to the permissions afforded, you see the icon with the little human, the CC BY, the CC BY SA icon, which has the little arrow kind of looping back on itself, and the CC BY NC, the dollar sign with a slash through it, and then a combination of NCSA. Those are our four licenses that are compatible with OER. A simpler way to think about this is actually by just going to these two websites. So I'm gonna really quickly see if I can share my screen. Let's see. Continue. So bear with me for one second. Are you seeing, let me just stop sharing. I wanna make sure you can see. We were able to see and it looked great, Jinrin. Oh, excellent, okay. Sharing again, one second. All right, so I can't see what you can see, but I'm assuming we're on the CC License Chooser page. So first, if you are looking for a license to apply to your work and make it an OER, look no further than our CC license chooser page. This page is actually the beta test for our revamped license chooser, but you can just type in CC license chooser um, to Google and I'm sure the first thing that shows up will be our, our main license chooser. The page walks you through simple questions to determine which license will best meet your needs for how you want to share your work. So for example, on the beta example for a revamped chooser, you'll start with a question, do you know which license you need? And you can say no. Next, do you want to attribute your work or attribution for your work? You'll likely say yes. Do you want others to use your work commercially? Maybe yes, maybe no. And do you want others to be able to adapt or remix your work? So you can say yes, no here, whatever you determine will, will fix the license that best meets your needs. So you can then simply copy and paste the license information onto your work and you've openly licensed your educational resource. Okay, so that's if you want to openly license your own work, but what if we are looking at using other 
open educational resources for maybe a an anthology that we're creating or some other some other work that is mixing other resources there are a lot of recommended practices out there the one that i find really useful um, there are a lot of useful ones the one that i want to direct our attention to right now is this wiki page on best practices for attribution this gives you a number of different examples of how to work with others openly licensed materials in a way that honors um, their um, their attribution and their creativity the one thing that is i think most essential to draw from this page is no matter how you are working with other people's works um, remember tassel so title author source and license if you add the title author source and license to your works to honor the previous works from which you drew, then you are likely covering all of the bases that you need to, and then some, um, with um, attribution. So today I've talked a little bit about what to do for licensing your own work, a little bit about what to do for um, acknowledging others' open licensed works when you remix them, but there's so much more to talk about. I actually, I wanna stop there and um, leave plenty of room for questions at the end um, and also make one last plug. If you want more information than this really quick overview, just go to certificates.creativecommons.org. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you, right. that was so exciting. And I'd like um, Will Cross to introduce himself next. But before we do, I'd like to answer one quick question in the chat. So we had a question from Marisol and she's asking if she'd like to write an OER book, any advice on how to begin and how does this process begin to do this? Um, a lot of publishing folks uh, just start writing their books, but there are communities of writers who get together. One of my favorite um, communities is the Rebus community and they get um, authors together to create textbooks you can also connect with um, Creative Commons who can talk about your licensing. And um, there's, there's a number of different places where you can start doing uh, collaboration with, with authors. So we can share those links in the chat. And next we'll talk to Will Cross and he can introduce himself. Go ahead, Will. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you for having me and, and thank you, Jen, for that excellent introduction. I'm Will Cross. You can see my title up there. Uh, in English, what that means is that I'm a lawyer who's also a librarian, so I'm really fun at parties. Um, and I wanted to, to thank you all for, for inviting me. I wanted to note that Rebus specifically has a resource called the Guide to Writing Open Textbooks So Far. That's a really nice sort of 101 primer to a lot of these issues. So I think what I wanted to do here is to sort of build on the good work that Jenren has done um, and, and zoom out a little bit to talk about copyright and the way that copyright sort of uh, relates to the work that we're doing here because copyright really is sort of the water that the open licenses swim in. Um, and I think about that old story about the two fish swimming ar along and they see another fish coming the other way and the other fish said, hey, how's the water today? And one of the first fish goes, what the heck is water? They're like it's this thing that's everywhere that's around everybody but we don't think about sometimes. And I think copyright often sort of exists in that context when we talk about open education and open educational resources. We jump right to the open licenses and that's really important, but I wanna suggest that copyright really loves and supports the work that we do as well. And we would do well to, to notice sort of the water around us that can support us in the same way that the licenses do as well. Um, as you can see here, I've, I've jumped right to the, the punchline here. Copyright loves education and it loves the work that we do as educators. That's true at the, at the most high abstract constitutional level, the way the system is structured with this set of limitations and exceptions. Um, and in particular, there's a suite of exceptions that Congress has created that, are, that were Congress's way of saying, we love you educators, keep doing the good stuff you're doing. And the example that we use most often is the sort of that 1101 face-to-face teaching exception where Congress specifically said, if you're in the classroom and you're doing education-y kind of stuff, show that movie, play that song, read that play, don't worry about copyright so much. Copyright support supposed to support the work that you're doing, enforcing it would get in the way, so, so don't sweat it. So everything that we do in education should be informed by this idea that copyright is a system designed to support what we do. And on the next slide, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about fair use, which is where the rubber very often meets the road 
uh, most sort of most recently. Um, fair use is a an, what we call an equitable rule. It means it was judge made and it ex it's existed for several hundred years. It was codified in the statute in the seventy six Act. And so, if you see a fair use presentation, you'll often see like a set of scales and then these four factors. Um, this is sort of the four questions you would ask yourself if you were trying to decide if your use was fair and thus you didn't need to worry about getting permission. Kind of what are you doing? What are you using? How much are you using? And then is your work a substitute for the original? And those are important questions to ask for sort of for the values they point to. But I'll suggest that the next slide actually does a better job of introducing fair use as a tool that we can use when we're making or engaging with open educational resources. And that is, for the past 25 years or so, um, the courts leading up to a Supreme Court decision have said that if you really want to know whether a use is fair or not, this question of transformation should be your first stop. When you're taking somebody else's work and you want to borrow it and use it, are you adding something new? Do I see your creativity shine through? Do I hear your own voice in the use? Or are you just kind of free riding off what somebody else is doing? And if you are adding something new, are you using the appropriate amount? And that question sounds a lot like uh, the way I grade assignments when I teach classes, right? Are you just, did you just copy somebody else or do I hear your creativity? Um, that sounds a lot like the way we understand contributions to open educational resources when there's a new addition or changes made and that kind of thing. So that touchstone of transformation, it's what the law wants you to think about. And it's also what we as educators think about a lot. Um, so let's go to the next slide and look at what that looks like in practice. I've picked uh, kind of a potentially a hard case. This is a commercial use. So when we're doing non-commercial educational OER kind of stuff, the law sort of favors us even more. Um, this is a neat example. Somebody was creating a book about the, the old rock group, The Grateful Dead, and they took a bunch of concert posters, right? In, in 1975, The Grateful Dead played at this venue, and this is what they were doing. This was the picture, and they arranged them into sort of a timeline. So as a way of illustrating the, the arc of that band's sort of career and trajectory, they wanted to use these images. So they reached out to the rights holder, the person who owned the images, and they said, is it okay if we use this? The rights holder said, sure, if you pay us this much money and do this set of things. They couldn't agree, they couldn't come to an agreement. So the creator, the scholar, just went ahead and used them without permission. And they said, I think this is fair use. We, we talked about whether we need permission or not, but as a matter of fact, the law permits me to do this whether or not I get permission. Um, the rights holder, of course, sued, and in the end, what the judge said is, yes, this is fair use. You don't need permission to do this sort of thing because it's transformative, right? A concert poster exists to get people to come to a concert. This scholarly work, this educational work was transformative in that it was presenting the posters in a new context. And you can sort of think through that in terms of the four factors. The purpose of the use was transformative and educational, the nature of the work, you know, you can sort of work through those four factors, but that, that touchstone of transformation really shines through. What you're doing here adds value to the world. It brings your own creativity to bear to do new stuff. And when we're dealing with materials with an open license, it's easy to know whether you can use it or not. But I want to suggest that even when you're using materials that aren't openly licensed, copyright and specifically that fair use exception exist to support that kind of transformative use in new ways. As I say, this case was a commercial example, but we're doing, but when we're doing things non-commercially or educationally, the, the case gets even stronger and fair use even more has your back. So what does that look like for open educators? How can you take this principle of transformative use and apply it? And the answer is there, there are a great set of resources that I wanted to point you to called the Codes of Best Practice for Fair Use in, and they exist for various communities. There's one for academic and research librarians that I use every day. There's one for documentary filmmakers. There's one for software preservation and all these different things. There are a set of folks that I'm part of that are currently creating a code of best practices for fair use in open educational resources. And it's designed to say, hey, person creating an OER or person engaging with an OER, here's how to think about fair use in the context of creating an illustration like we did with the Grateful Dead case a minute ago. Here's an example of what it looks like to do responsible best practice when you're using something to analyze it or critique it some way. It's, it's sort of a set of here's what the community thinks, and we've done a boatload of interviews with folks, and a set of really smart lawyers, and we're, we're working with them too, think about how fair use applies in the context of open educational resources. So I think that tool is going to be really, really powerful as a way to sort of supplement and build on the open licenses that Jenren talked about before. So keep your eyes out for that resource. And then um, finally, on the next slide, I'm going to sort of come back to the punchline we mentioned a minute ago, 
and talk about the, the big lesson, the big takeaway that I want to give to you. Um, and the lesson is the same thing we said it a minute ago, copyright loves education. But specifically what I, what I want to say is we have this really powerful default that supports what we do, the water that we swim around in all the time. But there are all these opportunities to give those rights away, right? Whenever we, we license an agreement or we sign a publication agreement, we create the possibility of saying, under the terms of this license, I can't rely on fair use anymore. I give up some of that copyright stuff. Don't do that. Keep those rights for yourself. Whenever we choose a platform that has technical limitations, we create the possibility that the platform will, will basically lock us out of doing the remixing that we want to be able to do with an open license or under fair use or similar, right? And whenever we exist in the context of institutions where there's some sort of uncertainty or risk assessment happening, there's the possibility that your supervisor or you, if you're the supervisor, will say, we have that right, but I'm too scared to use it or I'm too uncertain to use it. So the reason I wanted to highlight those best practices is I think those give us a great way to say yes, to say this, this fair use thing, this copyright thing, it's at the heart of what copyright exists for. It's important for supporting the work we do as educators. Don't, don't sign it away, don't lock yourself out of it, and don't give it away because of uncertainty or fear. Really, really be bold and assert those rights that you have. So that's, the, that's sort of the big takeaway I wanted to offer. Um, stay tuned for the best practices. If you have questions about fair use, I'm happy to dig into those during our conversation. But I'm really excited to hear what Elaine has to say about OER. Wonderful. We have some amazing questions that are rolling in and a lot of great stuff. So um, would you like to answer just one more before we go to Elaine here? Um, Always happy. Yeah. Um, here's an interesting one. Let's like stump the uh, <laughs> stump the copyright lawyer, right? Um, how can we deal with films that are not available in digital format that need to be used in an online course? And I think there's another one. Of, you can. How about if I give you another one for cho for choice? Yeah. Um, interpret the face to face exception in the era of remote and online education. That's a good one, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. So, so that that's such a good question that Congress tried to answer it about 20 years ago. They created this thing <laughs> called the Teach Act, right? I told you the face to face is Section 1101. The Teach Act is Section 110. Too. It's literally right beside because it was their way of saying, hey, digital and distance education is a thing. There needs to be a comparable exception to address that issue. The challenge with the TEACH Act is it was written in great technical detail with a set of assumptions that kind of made sense in 2002, but are wildly out of date now. So it was the, the good news is Congress said, yes, that face to face thing should exist in the same way in the online space. The bad news is they didn't do a very good job of writing the statute. I know it's hard to imagine Congress messing something up, but it happened at least that one time. Um, the good news then is that fair use, because it's this sort of exceptional exception that often fills gaps in the law or acts as a safety net under other exceptions, fair use is there to catch those sort of behaviors. So at my institution, when somebody says, can I show a film in the same way I would show it in the face-to-face -face classrooms, it's just for the students who are in the class, we're going to watch it, we're not going to give them copies, etc. I say, that's absolutely fine. That's probably fine under the TEACH Act. That's definitely fine under fair use. So, so go forth, do the, the non-commercial educational stuff that you know you ought to be able to do, um, and you can do it in reliance on sort of those two copyright exceptions in different ways. I think you passed the test. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and it wouldn't be WCET webcast if we didn't have some sort of federal policy thrown in there. So thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, yeah. Elaine, I am just thrilled to have you here. You are this mix of open education plus learning. I don't know anyone else who does what you do, and I'm just so grateful that you're here. Can you talk a little more about yourself? And then we are excited to hear your presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, as she said, I am the open education and distance learning librarian at the University of Arkansas. So essentially I work with our campus partners and stakeholders to coordinate all of our OER advocacy programs, um, adoption programs, and I'm also the distance learning librarian, which is great because our one of our main campus partners is our global campus, which is where all of our instructional designers live. So we do a lot of back and forth between the university libraries and global campus. Great partnership. We love it. 
So um, thanks, Will and Jinren, for kind of laying that foundation for me. I was asked to discuss practical applications of OER. So I'll be talking a little bit about what we do on our campus, um, maybe giving some keys or tips to uh, what, what kinds of things you can try um, in the practical everyday aspect of encouraging um, folks on your campus to adopt OER. So it's always a challenge to convince people to change their habits, to question their beliefs and practices, and to step outside their comfort zone. When encouraging the use of OER in the current reality, we will continue to face the typical challenges, but they will also be compounded by the constraints of a world in upheaval. I came up with five keys, tips, or strategies to keep in mind as we work with faculty who might consider integrating OER into their courses. First, a little background. I work at a public land grant institution with an enrollment of about 27,000 students. Just over uh, 2,200 of those students are enrolled in distance degree programs. Uh, there are uh, nine online undergraduate programs, 26 master's programs, and four doctoral programs. However, many more than those 2,200 students take proper online courses. And currently, we also have courses being taught via remote delivery methods. Furthermore, many university employees, including myself, are working from home. So that's just kind of, you know, setting the scene. I know many others are probably dealing with similar situations. And like others, we are dealing with the disruptions caused by the global pandemic. Because of the new uncertainties and the unusual reality, we've had to alter our approach to OER advocacy. So back to the five keys. First, adjust expectations. Just know that uptake may be slow in some areas, but more readily accepted than expected in others. Uh, plans to offer broad copyright, fair use, and Creative Commons education to campus stakeholders may need to be simplified or incorporated and featured as a component of overall OER adoption strategies. Next, practice flexibility. If you have potential adopters who need extra help to get their courses converted, be willing to lend a hand if, you're, if you are able. So as an example, um, at the beginning of the summer, one of our communication instructors found one of the University of Minnesota uh, business management books that she wanted to adopt in her communication leadership course. Um, this allowed her to replace an expensive textbook that she previously used and didn't like very much. And rather than introducing her to our Pressbooks platform, um, giving her videos about how to clone the textbook and rearrange the chapters to suit her needs, I determined that I could more quickly uh, work, do the work for her. So I figured I had the capacity to do this. It was going to make it easier for her to get the adoption through. Um, and so I decided to execute this project. Sometimes flexibility in our roles and expectations, um, we need to uh, are, are vital when we're encouraging OER um, progress during times like these. This flexibility will also serve us well in matters such as um, deadlines and expectations regarding OER project completion. We really need to think about meeting our stakeholders where they are. Next, strengthen partnerships. Um, the only way that OER advocacy and adoption on campus can be successful is through partnerships established between campus stakeholder groups. Successful programs have willing advocates who might be librarians, instructional designers, administrators, student government leaders, or faculty champions. However, these advocates find success when they partner with stakeholders to get OER into the hands of students. And I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of my presentation when I kind of show an example. Uh, next, cultivate mental agility. Mental agility is one of the key components of learning agility. We need to stay mentally agile in order to process new information as it comes in and to innovate in times of change and disruption. Professor and marketing consultant Dory Clark stresses the importance of creating cultures of mental agility within organizations. So as advocates for OER, we can model this attribute on our campuses. We can embrace trying new methods of promoting and embracing OER in this challenging environment. As Clark says, we can't control outcomes, but we can celebrate and encourage innovative processes or, in the case of OER, innovative advocacy efforts to encourage adoption. 
We need to listen to and encourage diverse points of view. And this can help encourage others to embrace the possibility to, of adopting disruptive learning resources like OER and move outside traditional avenues of selecting and assigning course materials. And this point leads me to the final key, count all progress as success. Higher education is entrenched in decades old systems of practice. And we cannot become dissuaded when our efforts to advocate for OER don't immediately meet with the success we envision, especially now. All progress, all activity, all conversations with potential adopters should be counted as success. These things are progressive steps leading, to the, leading in the right direction. Uh, nothing ever happens as fast as we'd like, of course. The pandemic has slowed progress and for some wiped out OER funding. Some advocates and stakeholders also find themselves with heavier workloads. We can't let these setbacks determine the future. Continue doing what you can do and continue generating innovative, flexible and thoughtful advocacy approaches. Persist in educating your campus whenever and however you can on the value of Creative Commons and the basics of copyright. And finally, I'd like to share with you an example of an approach we've taken here at the University of Arkansas. There we go. So um, this wasn't my deal or even my program, but I'm lucky enough to have been invited to participate. Um, I wanna share this example because um, it kind of personifies the value of partnerships, agile thinking and flexibility. The instructional design team on our campus hosts course development workshops for faculty um, who are creating new online courses or rebuilding existing courses. And because of the pandemic, this event, of course, had to be moved to an online format. The virtual course development showcase was born using a virtual poster session format. And because the university libraries and global campus have established a strong partnership over the last four years, I was invited to participate by providing a poster session in the form of a short video on OER and hosting a Q&A session. This approach provided a distinct audience of faculty engaged in developing new courses, which can be a foundation for adopting open resources. Um, and it can provide a more affordable course cost for their students and help them innovate their online teaching. This approach showcases um, one of the ways we can adapt our outreach through partnering, flexibility, and agile thinking. So I'll turn it back over to Tanya now. Elaine, it was just awesome to hear the work that you're doing and um, see what a, a leader you are in your community with open education. Thank you so much for talking about your principles and how you work with people. Uh, we have some great questions for the team and it looks like quite a few Q&A in the chat. Um, first of all, Dorothy wonders if you would mind sharing the link to that innovation showcase that you were talking about if there's a possibility to show the work that you did with your um with your campus and clearly you were key to that success so it'd be great to see the work that you um that you shared um, and then also there are some other questions in the chat i'm not sure if you want to talk to that or if you can just share it out elaine and then i think there are some um, digital and copyright questions that we have for Jenrin and maybe Will Cross. So one of the questions um, that came in has to do with the NC license. This is always a sticky one. <laughs> um, and whether or not you can use an NC license if you're charging tuition, that um, non-commercial Creative Commons license. And I'm wondering if, Jenrin, if you'd like to talk about that a little bit. And I have my opinions and I know there's a lot, so. Let's hear what you have to say. Sure, and actually this came up um, very recently in a, a very long set of um, email and response chains on our, our open license or our open education platform listserv. So um, there's so much to say about this. Very simply, the NC license refers to use, not user. So if the use case is intended for profit, then you are violating the NC license. If the user does not intend um, to make commercial profit, 
then that is likely okay. So a quick example, let's say a college bookstore or um, a college entity like a newspaper um, for, let's say they're using a CC by NC licensed material for some kind of internal um, staff development, maybe within the bookstore, I'm not sure if, if that's a good example or not, um, or um, within you know, some kind of um, student newspaper activity. Um, if they're not intending commercial gain from that, then they're welcome to use it. Same with a for-profit business. If, if a for-profit business uses an NC licensed work um, for internal uh, employee development, then that's okay. But similarly, if you are a nonprofit organization and you are working with an NC licensed work that you are intending to make profit off of, you know, sell some poster, I won't say a Grateful Dead poster um, based on the, the previous case mentioned, but um, if you're looking to make profit off of a, an otherwise um, an NC licensed work, then um, you would be infringing on that copyright. I made that a little longer than it had to be, but it comes down to use. Really is a question that is debated hotly and frequently in um, talking about the licenses. So if you're fascinated with this conversation, you can always join the CC platform and participate in conversations and talk to other um, Creative Commons uh, enthusiasts. I always enjoy um, seeing the, the conversations that are there. Um, and we have questions um, from another, from other people that are um, participating. Um, okay, here's one from Olga. Is the use in an online course violation of um, copyright? We're at a, let's see, my, I'm looking, it disappeared for a second. Uh, we're at a public university that charges students for tuition and they're not profiting, but is it considered profiting? So um, I would maybe defer to Will when you're talking about um, educational use. If you use an online, um, go ahead and do you see, I don't know if you see that one in here. It says, is the use in an online course a violation of copyright? Mm, okay, great, great question. And, and I want to sort of build on what was said a minute ago, too. Um, the great thing about the open licenses is they work sort of in tandem with all the copyright and the copyright exceptions. So you could say, I'm allowed to use this under an open license. And then you could also say, or I'm allowed to use this under fair use as well. So you, you they kind of stack in that way. Um, the question about use in sort of online contexts and whether that's commercial or not, there's the, is that commercial in the sense of the licenses? which right, the licenses define that in a pretty specific way. And I shared the Great Minds case where at least one court weighed in on that and CC shared a, what they call an amicus or friend of the court brief that sort of articulated at least one set of perspectives about it. Um, a sort of related question is whether that's a commercial use in the context of uh, fair use or those copyright exceptions that we've talked about. So one of the limitations of the TEACH Act is you have to be a, a nonprofit institution. But the language there is very specific. If you are a nonprofit educational institution, even if you're charging tuition, as all or most institutions do, your use is still nonprofit in the same way that Jenlin described it as being potentially non-commercial. So you can still rely on those exceptions um, that are designed for non nonprofit, non-commercial educational use, even though you're charging tuition. So I think that's the good news. The, the second thing to say there is that fair use one of the questions to ask is whether your use is commercial or not, but there are plenty of uses that are fair uses that were also commercial uses, right? I shared the, the, the book example because it says exactly that, but the, right, the, great, the, the case that decided we got to have VCRs back in the day that continues to apply now, that was a commercial use as well. So, so it's important not to conflate whether a use is commercial or not with whether it's fair or not. That's one of the factors, but not the only factor. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so this might be a question that Elaine would like to talk about because you spend a lot of time finding resources for faculty and you are a librarian plus online so you might um, know where to find things. So here we have a question um, from Alexis and she wonders what, um, what OER repositories are out there. So the question is I'm working on making a state level OER repository 
Is there someone I can reach out to who has already done something similar? And I'm trying to get this off the ground for 16 technical colleges. So I have ideas, um, but I'd like to throw that to Elaine first. If you were um, starting in a repository or if you had someone questioning where they might go to access someone else's repository, um, where would you start? So that's a great question. That's something we've discussed in our state as well. Um, but we've kind of gone to um, creating lists of um, the best search tools out there because there are so many different repositories. So rather than recreating, you know, something that's already out there, um, Oasis from SUNY is a great search tool to use. Uh, there's also the Mason MetaFinder. Um, also, um, you know, the Open Textbook Library, those are great places to start. Um, you can set up um, an area in OER Commons. If you want to set up a repository for your state, that might be a good tool to use if you don't have an institutional repository. Um, just some things to maybe get, get started. That's great. And we have seen, uh, you know, just recently, um, one example of a repository that lost state funding was in the state of Florida and Orange Grove just recently had to shut down and go offline. And so there has been what Elaine was suggesting, a greater movement toward using search tools to find the OER that's available rather than creating a new repository. Um, and Jenna, you might have some ideas about that too, just on you know, the availability of already available open materials rather than starting another place to put them. Sure. So I know a lot of people tend to um, shy away from starting new repositories because they can quickly become out of date or hard to um, hard to maintain. And there are also there are a number of different open repositories um, out there. I, I think um, OER Commons is probably my favorite. Um, it, I guess it really depends on the, the needs of your community and the resources that you have um, at your institution to, to work with those needs. Um, I think I, I can follow up with a few other examples after this. I have to do some digging. Mm -hmm. I see. One, yeah. of the places, one of the places Elaine mentioned was the University of Minnesota Open Textbook Library which has, I think, something like 700 open textbooks currently and adding new every day. So um, we, we mentioned a number of repositories and I see in the chat that Will has been just putting in all kinds of great links for your reference. So thanks, continue to do that. I appreciate it. Um, and we can move on to other questions here from the, from the audience. How much time do I have left here, Megan? So many good questions. <laughs> Sorry, I was having a hard time finding my unmute. We have plenty <laughs> of time, so I have about three to five minutes at the end, and I will certainly want to acknowledge all of you, but there's a lot of great questions, so let's get through all we can. Okay, um, so there's one more question. This is a good one, uh, and it's about online education as well as fair use. This is from Sierra, and she said, if I, if I want to embed a YouTube video in my online course, and it is not uh, licensed Creative Commons, and I embed it because it will be for fair use. Great question. Yeah, really good question. So, so the first piece of good news there is uh, embedding, linking to things generally doesn't implicate copyright in the first place because you're not actually copying something, right? You're just sort of pointing to a resource. And the majority of courts have held that embedding works pretty similarly, that there's not a copyright issue to embed something unless you embed it in such a way that it removes information or sort of cuts off any monetization that's happening. And YouTube's terms of use are pretty clear about that one as well. The challenge in that context, of course, is that if you link to something or embed something and it goes away, it goes away, right? You don't actually have it. You're just pointing to, to something. And if it gets taken down or changed or removed, that can be problematic. And of course, when you link out to places like YouTube, um, whenever I go to YouTube, I see a lot of kind of yucky political ads right now, and I might not feel comfortable sending my students to a platform where they're going to be inundated with who knows what sort of advertisements or that kind of thing. Um, so the conversation that's often had is whether you can sort of archive a resource like that. 
Um, the quick answer is that fair use will often support that sort of archiving, but not always. So we need to get into the specifics. Um, but, but said quickly, it's generally fine to link or to embed. You can also think about archiving when that's appropriate. And we can talk at another time about what would make it appropriate. Wonderful. Okay, so there's some really interesting. Um, here's Anna. She's wondering, she's another librarian and librarians are the foundation of open education work. So welcome, Anna. So happy to have you. Um, she's got a copyright question as well. Can faculty at a nonprofit private institution stream a video? This is really, this is really technical, but I'm sure you get these questions. Can a faculty at a nonprofit private institution stream a video in a class that we own in the library, but from a platform they personally subscribe to? It's not OER related. So faculty are trying to be innovative in an online environment when they don't have access to the library resources. Yeah. So if I if I hear this question right, this is the Netflix question, basically, right? We have a, a subscription to Netflix or Hulu or that sort of thing. Um, can we stream that? This is a, a moment where I'm going to answer once with a lawyer hat on and once with not a lawyer hat on. Um, with the lawyer hat on, the Netflix terms of use, and this is true for Hulu and Amazon Prime and Disney Plus and everybody else, say that the use should only be for what they describe as either personal or private use, meaning it's for you and your family around the TV or that kind of thing, that the licenses themselves don't contemplate a professor showing that, streaming that over their sort of to a class at distance. Um, so with the lawyer hat, I'd say you need to think about the, the agreement that you clicked through and certainly read, right? We all read all of those click-through agreements all the time. Um, taking the lawyer hat off for a second, libraries have tried for years to create a, a market for institutional licenses for that content. Libraries have done everything we possibly can and we've, we've gotten emails from people saying like, just go ahead and do it, but don't ask us about it or whatever from Netflix. Um, I think there are a lot of institutions that have said like, there's not a market we're undercutting here, so we're just going to go ahead and do it. The, it. It feels like it's necessary because there are a lot of resources that aren't available except through that platform. In a time of pandemic, I'm going to value the safety and well-being of my students above the technical terms of terms of use in a particular license. Um, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer, so I can't tell you what the right answer is in that context. But that's the way I would think through that question with and without a lawyer hat on. Can I add something to that? Please. Um, some of those platforms, I know Netflix, for example, they also have a certain group of their films that they say are, they give educational uh, streaming rights to. Now, in person versus online, you know, you need to figure that out. You know, for example, I know one of them is 13th, which we've had faculty ask us to purchase that film for the library. It's only shown on Netflix, Ava DuVernay's 13th. Um, but that is one that they give um, the Netflix account holder the right to show um, for educational use. So you may also check that depending on what the film is. I love these. I love these questions and the discussion. Um, I, so there, here's a great question. This will be our last one for today. And the question is from Marisol and she said, if a student doesn't have a textbook, but needs about three different chapters scanned. Is it possible to do that or is it a copyright problem? And I'm just telling you right now, I did that for my students. So when I was um, teaching <laughs> at a tribal college, I scanned a lot of chapters and sent it to students who didn't have access to the textbook. That's probably why I started um, being interested in open education because I was tired of my students not having access to their textbooks and realizing that a lot of them couldn't afford the materials and so I was doing a lot of copying, but don't tell. Okay, so is that um, a problem with copyright if it's about three chapters? So the, the challenge there is we talked about this idea of transformation or transformative use as being the touchstone for fair use. Um, taking a textbook and using it to analyze the way we taught something over time might be a transformative use. But taking a textbook and just making it available freely to students probably isn't transformative in that way, right? So your fair use argument doesn't go away, it just gets a little bit weaker. Um, you have to balance that against the purpose, the educational purpose, um, the fact that we're in a global pandemic right now and the world is on fire, uh, and sort of make your own decision in that context. When I talk to my counsel's office, one of the rules of thumb for us is, which lawsuit would you rather defend, right? But if you do the scanning and you give it away, maybe there's a copyright lawsuit and that's bad publicity a little bit. 
But if you go the other way and a student who needs it for reasons of, uh, you know, an accommodation for a disability or for public health and safety, and then they get sick or they're harmed in some way and they bring a lawsuit, which one do you want to be in court defending? And I'd rather be in court saying, I did what I had to to help my students. Sorry, I messed up on copyright. Please forgive me, oh jury of people in my state who love my institution. Rather than saying, sorry, student, I'm sorry you had to get really sick. We had to be really sticklers about copyright. I don't want that. I don't want to have to defend that lawsuit. So, so that's, that's a lawyerly way of talking about the values here. And so I think a lot of institutions right now are saying, I'm going to center values of health and safety and humanity and compassion rather than values of draconian adherence to every last bit of the law. But every institution has their own policies. Okay, mic drop. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Great way to end the session. And Elaine and Jenren and Will are just so many, so many thank yous to you. Gratitude. So Megan, take it away. Great. Tough act to follow, but thank you so much. And Tanya, thank you for introducing WCET to these amazing panelists and pulling this together. We really appreciate everyone and your time. Thank you for the great questions. If you're new to WCET, be sure to visit our website. We have tons of resources on our site. We also have an upcoming seminar series that you can learn details about. We have two topics. The first is on inclusiveness in higher education, and the second is where we're going to pull Tanya in to talk about quality, affordability, the actual value, whether that's perceived value or true value of higher education, and what we want the future of higher ed to look like. So visit the website, get all the details there. We are always putting together new webcasts, so stay posted on our website. And we couldn't do this work without the help of our supporting members and our sponsors. So just a quick acknowledgement to them. And we will send the link out to the recording with captions, as well as try and compile all these resources that were shared via links. So again, thank you for spending your day with us and stay well. Goodbye. Great job, everyone. Thank you so much. You were all magnificent. I knew you would be.